Thank you very much, Anika, and I'd like to thank Philips Healthcare for inviting me to uh, present my cases and, and my, um, my ability to show what we can do with this new software and technology. So my name is Professor Shahab Al Saadi. I am a professor of medical imaging at King Khalid University in Saudi Arabia, also accreditation and technical officer at the American University of Beirut. Uh, my whole career so far has been entrenched heavily into research and looking at patterns of imaging and how they're affecting patients clinically. So let's start the presentation. If you come to look at radiology as it stands today, previously we've always been known to be radiologists or radiographers or in the medical imaging technology where we're looking at detection and diagnosis. If we are truly detecting or diagnosing patients with the equipment that we have, this should give a better patient outcome. However, this is really not the case. We are at the heart of a holistic approach in medicine. We're looking at both healthy living from when you're born to when we are today. We look at diagnosis and treatment in case patients do get sick and how we can actually treat them and detect them and keep evaluating them with degrees with disease regression or disease progression. And then we look at recovery and end of life cycle. So when we're looking at radiology, we're not just looking at a point within the patient's medical treatment or medical time of diagnosis. We're looking at them from the beginning towards the end and we have a holistic approach to medicine. Radiology no longer is going to be a diagnostic tool but it's also going to become very soon a therapeutic tool in the way we move about it. So if we have a look how we have progressed over time, up here at the top left-hand corner of the screen, you have here where the green arrow is, a surgical representation of a diseased aortic valve. There's significant errors of calcification, and this was determined as the gold standard. When you needed to go in, you needed to see inside the patient surgically However, this had high risks and poor patient outcomes. As we move along towards the 80s and 90s of CT imaging technology, we started to see calcification, but we saw this large blooming artifact around this. So it's quite hard to be able to quantify this. As imaging technology advanced and with stronger computer power, now if you look at this image down here at the 3D section of the aortic valve, it is exactly replicating what we used to see in surgery. This has now dramatically changed the way we look at imaging and the way that imaging is actually used in medicine. We are no longer people just looking at diagnosis. We can now tell them functionally what is happening. We can also tell them radiologically how we can fix the patient without going inside and having large open thoracotomy surgeries, which potentially uh, could have post-operative complications and reducing life expectancy. So just before we start to talk about advanced imaging uh, processes, I'd really like to uh, demonstrate that there is a large difference between PACS, which is a picture archiving communication system, and advanced post-processing. So if you think about it like this, you have a horse. It is strong. This is a workhorse. We can do our imaging here. We capture the information and we look at the images as they are orientated or how they are given to us. However, in reality, sometimes we're going to find a lot of questionable areas depending on our slice thickness. So, for example, if you look here to your right-hand side of the image, you have advanced post-processing techniques. This is an example of the left anterior descending coronary artery. This is a 48-year-old patient who has been admitted to the ER with chest pain. There was ST changes and elevation. And as you can see here along the curved NPR, you can see areas of calcification. What is even more concerning, on this curved NPR, I cannot see a supra, um, or at the origin of the left anterior descending coronary artery, I cannot see this calcification. However, if I move further down here, where you follow the green arrow, at the level of the bifurcation, I have full access to my data. I can manipulate the data in any plane or resolution that I want in order to give me accurate, confident uh, diagnosis for this patient. So, for example, this patient now does not need to go up to the coronary cath lab and have an interventional procedure to see if there's blockages of the coronary arteries. 
we can actually see now that there is clear contrast media delivery through the origin to the distal aspect of the coronary artery, as you can see in this lumen view. And this now reduces patients' potential poor outcomes through interventional procedures and completely changes the treatment outcomes. This patient went on to have aggressive drug therapy treatment and went on blood thinning medication. So in my opinion, when you're looking at advanced pulse processing, we're not looking anymore between a horse and a Ferrari. We're looking at, we have data, and this data allows us to do more than what we've ever been able to do. So the PAX environment, I can only see data in one single plane. Whereas if I look at advanced pulse processing, I have source data, and I can do anything I want with this data. If I have a question mark, like I saw here within the calcification of the left anterior descending coronary arteries, I can make an informed decision and be confident in what I'm doing for patients is going to have a better patient outcome. So let's just give an example about how radiology is becoming and, and changing very rapidly. If you look at this large green cylindrical structure, you look at this box here, which is denoted by A, and this box here denoted by B, you think that these two boxes are the same in terms of their opacity, in terms of their uh, hue or density, and also in terms of their color. But realistically, the mind can play tricks on us. and We cannot afford to allow our minds to make these tricks. We spend long hours on these computer systems making diagnoses for patients and looking at thousands and thousands of images. Imagine if you could just automatically work something up and view it in the way you're able to view it and to have clear, concise information. So what is the biggest problem that we're facing? Normally when we come to buy a CT scanner and MRI, you know, the radiologist says, okay, I want to have a CT workstation, I want an MR workstation, I want to have a nuclear medicine workstation, and of course I have already an existing PACS workstation. The reality is there's no such modality which is actually superior to the other. All modalities complement each other. And this has caused significant issues in the current workflow efficiencies in the radiology department. If you look at the image below, you'll see here there are multiple computers, if you follow my arrow, which represent the CT workstation, the MRI workstation, nuclear medicine workstation, and so forth. This is taking so much more time out of our work. If I'm sitting on the CT workstation, but I need to go cross-correlate cor with an MR patient of the same patient who had MR of the liver, and somebody else is already sitting on this, I am now reducing my workflow efficiency. I don't have access to the data when I want and how I want. And this is the reality of current radiological practices. So this is where the ISP, or IntelliSpace 7 portal, has allowed us to give us freedom of data and information in the radiological world. If I have multiple, multiple modalities, as you can see here, I have a, a CT, an MR, nuclear medicine, and these don't necessarily need to be Philips. This could be any vendor whatsoever. All this data is channeled into one single area. This area allows me, for example, I could be at home on my um, mobile phone where I could be called at 3 o'clock in the morning for an urgent consultation where the radiology resident or registrar was unable to make an informed decision, I can log in through my iPad. At the same time, I can have a radiologist sitting in the United States, and I'm here in Beirut, like I'm giving a lecture to you guys right now via a webinar. You know, I can sit on my laptop in another country, or I can actually view this through the workstation. I now have access to this information, and I can look at this in information simultaneously while another cardiothoracic surgeon is looking at it in the ER, and I could be home in my bed what, through the laptop to give an informed decision about a patient who has acute coronary syndrome or potentially um, you know, coronary calcium uh, deficit, which is causing significant chest pain. And the beauty of all of this, this all can be integrated into PACS, into HIS, into RIS, into EMR. The ability to not just buy a single standalone workstation to have access to information, but now you can integrate this into all other imaging and uh, imaging viewing modalities as well. So 
So let's now start looking at some interesting cases. This is a case where we had to intervene as radiologists when there was a patient who presented with a large pulsating neck mass. So we did a CT angiogram. And if you just follow my arrows here, right here, this is the large glomus tumor. It is invading heavily into the upper cervical lateral aspect, which involved also the sternocleomastoid. It did not cause displacement. So if you have a look here, we have here the right common carotid. It breaks off to be the right internal carotid artery. As we follow it around, this actual lesion has, seems to us that it has engulfed the arteries. However, if you look at the external carotid arteries, it has actually gone through and dissipates within it. Now, the next thing I'd like to add, which is very, very important, is this entire lesion has caused a shift of this internal carotid artery. So if a surgeon wants to come in and have a look at this right now, if you was to look at the actual images, and this was a 5 o'clock in the morning CT scan, the radiology resident or registrar is going to find a difficult time to determine whether this is an arterial filling tumor or venous filling tumor or vice versa in terms of draining. The biggest issue we have here right now is because I had access to this data, I actually went through and I was able to look at the internal carotid artery and you can see the image on your left. If I just take a quick look here, the image here on the left, okay, the tumor is heterogeneously enhanced. And to this heterogeneously enhanced tumor, we found that there was no arterial blood supply. If the surgeons went in there and assumed that this was an arterial blood or an arterial lesion, they would have had to do a clamping of the lesion to prevent blood flow to that area. Interventionally, it's not very possible to go in through radiological intervention to give embolization to reduce this tumor. This needs to be surgically removed. However, what is more interesting, if we turn around, so this is here, the internal carotid artery has now been stretched and pushed anteriorly. And also it's causing shifting within the uh, nasopharyngeal space. Because this is a curved NPR, and because of this advanced post-processing work extension, where I have access to this information, and I was not happy with the reconstruction the radiology resident gave me, I locked in and I actually rotated the vessel of interest into a curved NPR and found that there was no arterial blood supply to this lesion whatsoever. So the next step this made me understand was, if this is, has no arterial blood supply to this area, then definitely this must be a, a venous filling structure. This now has changed the way we've looked at medicine. So let me tell you how we actually got this. So this is a practical uh, tip. If you look up here, you have this, the contrast characteristics between the aorta, vein, and lymph nodes. So we have the injection phase, the arterial phase, venous phase, and equilibrium phase. So the aorta, so the vein likes to opacify at about 70 seconds. Now, these veins we're talking about is the internal jugular vein, the thyroid veins, and so forth. As we move along, if we look at the different injection phase, the arterial phase happens anywhere between 18 to 30 seconds with the internal carotid arteries. So if we're scanning too early, we get a nice arterial face. If we're scanning too late, we get venous face, but we're going to miss the arterial system. So what we do as we go along, we also need to understand when we're looking at head and neck cancers or tumors or AVMs, we need to be able to delineate, is this an arterial filling structure, a venous filling structure, or is this a large necrotic lymph node which, or a metastatic lymph node which has grown excessively? So what we do here is, we actually inject contrast at a slower rate, at 2.5 mils a second. We prolong the CTA duration, so we have good opacification within the vein, within the artery, and also within the lymph node. So we can provide large separation between these areas, so we can determine whether this is an arterial or venous filling structure. So here is, a, is another example. Yes, there has been significant advances in iterative reconstruction. So here, if you have a look at the left here, you have IDOS-4, which is a hybrid raw data and image data domain re iterative reconstruction. 
And right here where the arrow is, we can actually see this tumor. This is a metastatic lymph node. However, if we zoom it up, we start to see a lot more image noise making it difficult for us to comprehend. Now with this new imaging technique where we're looking at model-based iterate construction, you can actually see now clearly the actual lymph node, the necrotic lymph node, and the necrotic core. What's more importantly, we can now see clear delineation of these tumors, whether it's a mass, whether it's a lymph node, and we can actually clearly see these sharp borders. And the beauty of being able to see this, this allows us to quantify this information a lot better. This is another interesting case of a seven-year-old um, pediatric patient who, you know, under generally low-dose CT, we use the same protocol where you have here the arterial, the vein, and the artery equally enhanced. So there's complete separation and delineation. We saw this large mass sitting in the supraclavicular lymph node. If I look here at the bottom of the coronal plane on your left-hand side, okay, you actually see here a lymph node, but it looks very grainy because of the artifact in the thoracic junction. However, with the different imaging reconstruction technique and opacification patterns, you see that there's a large necrotic lymph node. But let's take this one step further. We now have tumor actually invading the actual rib and going into the pleura. This now is not a surgical uh, treatment option. This now becomes a chemotherapy and radiation therapy treatment option. So now I'll ask Yannicka just to show us live in Telespace Portal how we look at multimodality imaging of lymph nodes within the abdomen.